welcome back to the first Talking Bollocks of 2024 with me, your host, Howard H. Smith. Yeah! Yep, it's all the same as it ever was. Welcome back, welcome back to the Talking of Bollocks with your host, me, 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 me. Um, well, in case you didn't know, I sing in UK thrash band Acid Rain. I host the official Motorhead podcast, that, uh, The Motorcast. I also host a weekly football co- uh, podcast called The Reducer with a couple of comedians, fellow comedians, because I also does that. So check that out. Link in the show notes. Um, I don't know, does anybody ever fucking click those things? Do you? Let me know, please, because otherwise I'll just fucking save myself... Uh, a bit of a pain in the ass and not bother doing it. So let me know. Um, there's also a link to... <laughs> yeah, actually, I should know already, shouldn't I? Uh, there's, a, there's a link in there where you can join the show at Patreon. Basically, it's pay for more of my ego. Um, I do deliver a lot of content. Um, I have been told it's one of the best out there. Uh, that's not for me to say. That's what I've heard. That's what I've been told by patrons. Um, and the loyalty of every single patron is incredible and really appreciated. It really is. And genuinely, I've been doing it since 2017 now, and it is like I've got a, a like a bunch of new friends all over the world. Now, admittedly, most friendships are not based on them giving you money. <laughs> so, I, but it is like they become my friends. So, if you'd like to pay to become my friend. <laughs> Then sign up for Patreon. It's quite relevant to this episode. Well, it's not really, because you'll have heard all of this music somewhere else, but I do a a monthly show called Radio Bollocks. Personally, I think that's worth uh, the money alone. Two hours of programming that you ain't going to hear anywhere else. It's whatever falls out of my head, and it could be anything from classic Queensryche to brand new death metal. Or also, stuff that's not even released yet. Mm -hmm. Check that shit out. Probably shouldn't have said that, but anyway, never mind. Hopefully, no record companies listening. In fact, why would there be any record companies listening? But if there are, do let me know. Um, We haven't really got very far, have we? There is a massive, massive irony about um, me recording this podcast today. Um, I'm recording this, and normally I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't date it. But this is a one-off in 10 years, right? I'm recording this on Sunday, the 14th of January. Um, busy laying down some guest vocals on Thursday um, for Inquire Within for their new EP. Friday, gigging in Plymouth, which, which is the other end of the country from where I'm at. I'm a, I know, I know. If you're in the US, you're probably thinking, that's pathetic, Howard. Shut up, stop making a big deal of it. But, you know, nine-hour round trip? Yeah, it's quite it's quite a big deal. So anyway, that's I don't know. I've completely dated this bastard, haven't I? If you're listening to this at any point in the future, sorry. Yeah, I know. Don't worry. None of the other episodes are like this. Um, so uh, yeah, I've been busy. Is basically what I'm saying. But I have um, I have got around to doing this podcast on January the fourteenth. The relevance of that is, it's ten years this very day that I released the first ever Talking Bollocks. And um, I remember starting it and thinking, um, you know, I wonder if this is, you know, I wonder if this is something that I'm you know, going to be doing in five years' time, never mind ten years. Or is it? Did I think that? I don't know. I, I'm not one for planning ahead. I'm, it's just like, right, just, you know, smash today, tomorrow will take care of itself. That's been my motto. Um, but I do think that... It's pretty incredible, really. I really... Do. And the 10 years has flown by. Flown by. For example, there is a little bit of a chat with um, with Hayton from Censor on the end of this episode because I felt like I, I needed to give you some sunken content that wasn't me. Bear in mind, you had uh, a whole episode of me earlier and you're going to get mostly me talking about music in this episode. So I had to put something in there. Uh, definitely looking at getting um, a, a longer interview with Hayton very soon. During the interview, he says, um, well, our first album's going to be 10 years, uh, it's going to be 30 years old next year. And I was thinking, is there, well, is there an album before Stacked Up? Because, like, I only interviewed him a few years ago, and, I'm, and that was like the, that was the 20th anniversary. And then I realised, after looking through the interviews on my phone, that the Censor interview was nine years ago. And I was just fucking blown away. 
because when I saw him at the venue, he was like, "All right, fella, how are you doing?" I was like, "Yeah, cool, man. How are you?" And it was, it was, it, it honestly felt like it had only been a few years. And then I look back through conversations on Twitter and stuff in the messages, obviously not tweets. And um, yeah, it was nine years since I'd interviewed him, and I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. Um, so anyway, uh, that's a bit of a tangent. F- tangent fans, excuse me, coffee is needed. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. All other odd part. All other other. All other other odd. I nearly called. I nearly called it an odd cast. <laughs> Welcome to the Howard H. Smith Ego Oddcast, otherwise known as Talking Bollocks. And I have talked a lot of bollocks already. Christ, if this is the first episode you've listened to or the first new one, having heard it's been, I've been banging on for 10 years, then um, fucking hell, you must be regretting that decision already. (laughs) Um, Well, uh, let's crack on, shall we? Let's crack on with... As always, the news, but only a little bit of news because uh, there's a lot to get through and I didn't want this episode to just be like too much of me banging on. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to um, I wanted to highlight um, and they're, they're probably not big news stories that anybody was expecting me to comment on. But, but Mudvayne's Chad Gray, who I have a lot of respect for, and for those of you who listened to the, the last episode, which was the anniversary special, if you haven't, go back and listen to it because um, it's had some great feedback. Um, Probably one of the very first interviews where I really, inverted commas, got into it with somebody and re- just had, like, what it felt like a moment. It felt like I was getting more than an interview. I was connecting with somebody, and I hate that word. I hate that. It's like, you know, connection and connecting with people is right up there with going on a journey. Overused phrases, but really good at describing what you're trying to get across. Anywho... I say that too much. I know. I'm sorry. Um, Chad Gray, great interview. Loved it. Wonderful. Thank you, Chad. Would be great to have you back on the show because it's been nearly 10 years. Anywho. Fucking hell. There you go. Right. I'm not going to say it for the rest of the episode. Fingers crossed. I could always just edit it out, couldn't I? But anyway, that's a start. (laughs) In an interview with Underground Australian magazine... Uh, Mudvayne frontman Chad Chad Gray lamented the lack of originality of a lot of the newer hard rock bands and heavy metal bands saying there is nothing separating one band from another Um, and basically saying that you know most music sounds the same Um, he says in recent uh, presence of new metal inspired artists he said Dude, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I don't give a fuck because in in me I've got stuff to say and I'm going to say it. Music now to me, God bless them, new bands, but they sound the same. All new music reminds me of the same fucking thing. There's nothing separating it, one band from another. It's like one band kind of does something, a hundred bands follow that band, then another band does something, then a hundred bands follow that band and sound like that fucking band. Now, I've got a lot of time for that. I, I know exactly where he's coming from. And I'm sure there's a fair few of you kind of like nodding along, listening to it going, yeah, he's got a point. Um, it's just that, I, I don't know, I, 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 I'm, I always, I'm always guarded when it comes to that, you know, they all sound the same all new music sound it's just I don't ever want to sound like the generation before me you know if you can remember when you were a young metaler and you had people going oh but you know all thrash bands sound the same and you just think you're not fucking listening you're not paying attention you're not listening hard enough or carefully enough or concentrating and yes there's no way they all sound the same and it's that it's that every generation thinks every previous, you know, thinks the every new generation coming along thinks their music is a bollocks and b all sounds the same, and I I just never want to be that guy. And I'm not saying that Chad is being that guy, but he's getting very close to it. And I think he's got some good points there about you know one band does something, and it's fairly groundbreaking, and you know it sounds it, it, it it's successful, and then a load of other bands follow it. Well. Yeah, I know that's nothing new. That's kind of always happened, but it's there's so much of it out there now. I think that is why it seems so um, so prevalent. Anyway, let's leave um, let's leave that to one side. And this one is a bit sad. Ex Saigon Kick singer Matt Kramer blasts former bandmates over upcoming anniversary tour. 
My inbox is getting flood, uh, flooded congratulating me about the new Saigon Kick Tour. This tour is not including me. It's the 30-year anniversary of Jason. Uh, sorry, this is brilliant, actually. It's the 30-year anniversary of Jason funneling hundreds of thousands of dollars of my personal publishing money that was demanded I not touch into the band so he could squeeze me out the band after I sang on a top 12 hit launching the band's uh, gigantic career. Then meticulously left me out absolutely penniless and confiscated all my gear so I couldn't even do writing sessions for a new product project immediately following uh, to go on and record the album Water, steal my vocal style, mimicking me trying to pass it off uh, um, uh, as if I never left the band and the vocal sound I created for Saigon Kick. First he stole all of my money, then he stole my job, and the fact he sings exactly like me is the ultimate robbery and a perfect example of why being a thief and absolute backstabbing maniac makes you win in the music business. <laughs> Zero respect for anyone on that tour. Definitely bitter, but it's more about the transparency. 30 years later, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Support the good ones, root out the evil. Fucking hell. I mean, that is fucking hard, isn't it? As uh, I'm sure Jamie Jaster would say. Well, that was, um, you know, that was all Mr. Kramer, the singer, and Jason Beeler fire, fire, uh, fires back. Maybe it's a new Marvel character called Super Victim. I know we are all looking forward to that on the big screen, Jason wrote. I hear the, I hear the pilot is about a guy who, no matter what happens or is shown to them, regardless of any facts, accepts no responsibility for anything in their own life or career. And somehow, even though they claim to be the most talented person in the room, never actually achieve anything of note in 35 years. Even though they are ignored by ne nearly everyone and no one with first-hand knowledge ever says anything publicly back to, uh, to back them up. Does our hero stop? Hell to the no. You have to admire someone banging their head on a wall for 35 years and blaming the wall. I'm hoping he's, pl uh, he's played by Daniel Day-Lewis or Joaquin Phoenix. It will be the most challenging role to show no action, no achievements, no accomplishments, not one single bit of forward momentum, just an ever-present um, pooty pre-cry lower lip, <laughs> pouty pre-cry lower lip. I mean, how do you emote nothingness and have it translate on the big screen? The climax may be a scene where our protagonist Protagonist is in the th in therapy, and the doctor says, "Show me on the doll where the music music industry hurt you." He continued, "The darkest part of the movie is when our hero whips up a little online hate group with nothing to back it up for people with no first-hand knowledge other than his verbal diarrhea. We enter a dark time where all it takes is one deranged person to put someone." or their friends or family at risk. Maybe we skip that part. I mean, that's how some of our heroes met an unfortunate end. And what a sane person would put the, that an energy into that universe. Maybe, yeah, it continues. Maybe the movie ends with an anti-hero, the evil scumbaginator, coming into the room and saying, if you, have, uh, if you have an issue, a real man would deal directly with people and attempt to correct it. Failing that, you would seek legal remedies. Super victim, trademark. It's time for you to put up or shut up. We have hundreds of pages of facts, first-hand witnesses and everything corroborated. But because we are not pre-teens on TikTok, we have never released or posted it. Then, with a sympathetic look, the scumbaginator, trademark, looks back and says, I hope you go on and do something truly great, truly super, which is absolutely fucking brilliant. Super victim, I wish you well. Surely someone would want to work with somebody so brilliantly influential, blameless and up upstanding. End scene. And it suddenly becomes apparent that scumbaginator, the not bass player and the angry drummer <laughs> were the heroes all along. It's like Sixth Sense, but instead of dead people, our star has, <laughs> has a complaint and would like to see the manager. Like a male Karen or MK for short. Catchphrase for the scumbaginator. If you have mistaken 35 years of my silence for weakness, when all along it has simply been pity, catchphrase for super victim. I'll never be back. <laughs> Said like an Arnold accent. I mean, Jesus Christ, he really has fucking gone to town there, hasn't he? I th yeah, wow. So you can see there why I um, I wanted you all to uh, <laughs> to know about that story. I mean, fucking hell. All these years later, bands arguing about shit. It's 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 a given, isn't it? It really is. It's always gonna fucking happen. Sorry, just had to do a little bit of a pause there. Um, had a phone call and had to take it. Not that um, that's of any interest to you. So anyway, that concludes the news. Now, what I'm going to go into 
is the my favourite albums of 2023, of which there was a top 10 until I realised... Well, I, I basically, I've got a page up of each one, um, you know, so I've got access to track list, etc. And, um, and it turns out one of them came out in 2022. <laughs> so, um, genuine fuck up there. So it's a top nine. The album, uh, by the way, that, uh, that I fucked up with was He Is Legend, Endless, Endless Hallway, for some reason. I mean, I remember that being my top five last year now. But for some reason, I've got that down in my top 10 this year. So there you go. I mean, it's so good. It's made it into the top albums of uh, of two years in a row. Well, it kind of hasn't. So it's now a top nine. Um, right. Let's get stuck in, shall we? This, please bear in mind, is in no particular order. None whatsoever. Right. Um but the first album on the list is um, a real surprise. This is a band I had never heard of up until last year. Um, and how I heard of them was I got um, a message to the Acid Rain group and it was from a guy saying, uh, hi there, um, we are a band. We've been going quite a few years, got a few albums out. This is the first one with vocals. We're all big Acid Rain fans, big influence, and um, it, 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 here's a here's a link. Be really interested to see what you think. And um, which, like, I, I, I mean, you know, play into my ego or what, you know, we're all big fans of Acid Rain. Well, in that case, mm -hmm, of course I'm going to give it a listen. And um, as I've probably mentioned before, Sometimes that really can be a double-edged sword. You know, sometimes it's the case of you listen and you think, oh, my God, really? I'm not hearing the influence. Not only that, but um, have we really inflicted th this band on the world? <laughs> no names. No, not mentioning anyone. Um, I, I, no one springs to mind, to be honest. So um, I downloaded it and I had a listen. And immediately I was like, oh, awesome. They sound nothing like Acid Rain. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you'd think my ego would work the other way around, but I just thought, wow, that's this is this is awesome. They they sound nothing like Acid Rain. This is like completely different, and it is. They, they, it, this is essentially a um, a prog album. But for for please for do not if you're not into prog. Do not start going, oh, right, okay, yeah, forget that one then. Not interested. Because there is, there's loads of killer riffs in this. Um, and it was it, a major surprise. Bought the CD um, because you've got to support your fellow artists, especially when, you know, over the years they've bought your stuff. Um, so pre-ordered the CD. I got to go and see them. Um, in London, it was one of my it was well, it was in my top two favourite shows of the year. The other one was Censor. Speaking to hate hate them later. Um, just a brilliant live show, and you know what? Really, really, um, that gig. So it's a tiny little gig at the at the Black Heart in London, and it just made me rediscover the joy of going to see bands in tiny venues and I just stood right between the middle of the PA like in the perfect spot to get a decent sound and the sound was great that night and I just absolutely loved it absolutely loved it and watching them all go at it um, first gig for ages you know and, and they just came on and absolutely rocked the joint it was fucking brilliant and um, and the album should probably mention the album. And the album is absolutely wonderful. And I haven't mentioned the band. The band are the Fierce and the Dead. Um, it's a fantastic album. Um, and, and do you know what? It's called uh, News from the Invisible World. Now, given what they'd said in their message and like chatting to them, obviously I had them on the show last year, as you all know. Um, this album has landed in just about every single pro prog top 10 there is in the UK. So don't take my word for it, kids. Take uh, proper music journalists' word for it. Um, it's absolutely cracking. From the very moment it starts with a song called The Start. I mean, come on. you got to love it, haven't you? 
Um, first track in Shake the Jar reminds me of um, the only decent era of Queens of the Stone Age, which is Songs for the Deaf. But that is, that's neither here nor there. Because we're going on a journey, folks. Every song could be by a different band. But it fucking works. They have just meshed everything together and created this fucking beast of an album, which I absolutely love. Oh, in fact, here's some um, here's some quotes I'm going to read you. Switching from metal to prog, surf and avant-garde, ambitious and grandiose stuff delivered impeccably. I mean, I've read that terribly. Let's do that again. Switching from metal to prog, surf and avant-garde, it's ambitious and grandiose stuff delivered impeccably. There you go. Now, it, that's, that's pretty much a writer's way of saying what I just said, right? The band combines massive riffs of shoegaze, metal and stoner rock properties, all enveloped in a progressive structure to create an engaging and hard-hitting piece. I'd say that's that's more accurate. Overwordy, but hey, if you're a journalist, that's what you fucking paid for, isn't it? Uh, being overwordy. So, yeah, don't take my word for it, take their word for it as well. Really, really, really do recommend... Um, Hello, sorry, News from the Invisible World by The Fierce and the Dead who, if you go to their social media if you're lucky, you might be able to pick up a ticket for one of the very few shows that they are doing to support this album, so if you in any way think it sounds interesting, go listen now, maybe at the end of the podcast not just yet, you might miss out on some of more stuff but go listen and if you in any way are thinking, wow this is rocking Go and see if they are playing near you and get yourself a ticket because you will not regret it. In fact, you'll probably message me and thank me for it. So that is the first of my top 10 albums of the year. Again, can't stress enough that this is not in order. Next up, well, I liked the first album in this series and I really like the second album in this series and I'm really glad that I've got to bring this up because um, yeah I fucked up here Um, the album is uh, from Devil Driver the album is Dealing With Demons Volume 2 and it is a fucking ripper it's one of those albums that creeps up on you you know what it's like when you get an album and you think yeah this is this is alright this I don't mind this yeah this, this is good yeah this ticks all the boxes then you listen to it again and you go yeah that is good isn't it and again and again and then after a while you're like do I appreciate how good this album is because like I seem to be playing it a lot maybe it's just me yeah but sometimes it takes quite a long while for me to go no, do you know what? This is really, really, really good and was released in 2023. So that's a, it's a relief to me. I've got the right year. Um, a fantastic album, a really fantastic album. Des, to this day, was one of my favourite guests to have on the podcast whilst he was driving round, um, which was really cool. And I did mention on the, on the anniversary episode that his wife had passed away. Yeah, that's right. I killed her off like some like some evil life real life movie director like some sort of god i um i killed off his wife thank you very much to the person who got in touch over social media and said i think you're like she's still alive <laughs> i really appreciate that mate um and i don't know what it is either about me or social media or whatever it is but only one person got in touch to say uh yeah you fucked up there mate Um, Now, whether or not I come across like somebody who is not going to take um, having um, errors pointed out very well or whether just nobody can be fucking arsed, I I don't know. But I did think that was quite funny. Certainly not funny that I made that mistake. Anyway, um, the album kicks off with I Have No Pity, which is just like a classic Devil Driver opener. I've got a soft spot for Devil Driver. I really, really have. Um... They, I, I think they're hugely underrated and I think Dez's place in the industry is fucking awesome, it really is um, he's like um, he's like an, um, he's like Jamie Jaster but not annoying do you know what I mean um, without the podcast and without the horrific um, Viagra substitute adverts he's um, you know he's I, I, I'm, I'm, I, know, I know I'm having a laugh about Jamie but he's also an incredible person who does a hell of a lot for the scene, I mean he's fucking saved and brought back the Milwaukee Metal Fest what have I done fucking recently 
not a lot. So fair fucks to Jamie. And he's an easy target, and it's a bit lazy of me to um, to constantly aim at him. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully people realise that I am being light-hearted. I'm backtracking now, aren't I? Because I'm really I'd love to have Jamie in the podcast, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. And why would it when he's got his own? Uh, which is a lot more successful than mine. So, yeah, there's that. Um, so, um, Des, yeah, great. And, yeah, he was driving around with his wife in the car. Turns out she's not dead. Well, that's good, isn't it? I have no pity. Cracking Oprah. Um, there's an awesome... There's just, just so many awesome tunes on this. Nothing Lasts Forever. Um, Bloodbath is a particular favourite. Um, and also something that I've played quite a lot on my uh, Radio Bollocks show, which is the closer on the album called This Relationship Broken. <laughs> I just love, I love, just, I, that is an awesome song title. Brilliant phraseology. Um, obviously, all of the performances rip. Des is great. There's some very cool lyrics on it. Some very cool lyrics. And I just, again, I like, I like the, um, I like the balls, the fact that he's come out and gone, look, right, we've done Dealing With Demons 1, and here's dealing with demons too. And given everything he's all, you know, that he's been through, um, he's, he's just kind of like basically poured it into two albums. Um, and it's just really impressive. Really, really impressive. If you're not a Devil Driver fan, you know, maybe, maybe this could be the album that changes your mind. And then you, you, like, you work backwards through the catalogue and you find some gems. Um, that's, that's your call, not mine. But when it comes to when it comes to my favourite albums of the year, uh, Devil Drive is in there, you know, and it, and it's it's yeah, it rocks, it rocks for me. So next up, the the very last entrant into the list because it came out December the eighth, I think. But I got an advanced copy of it, and as soon as I I'd listened to it, I think maybe no more than two times, and I just like emailed the PR straight away and said. Can I get somebody on, please? Um, Because I want to talk about this album. And they went, yep, no problem. Um, And that is going to be next month's... uh, Next month. It's going to be the next episode. The next episode will be with Zoltan from Ectomorph. Now, listeners to, again, Radio Bollocks, the patrons, um, know of my love for Ectomorph. I think I've mentioned them a few times on the podcast. Um... From Hungary, um, very much sort of groove metal, think kind of like Hungarian Soulfly meets Sepultura. Um, uh, it's not, it's not music that is going to make you go, "Wow!" Like this is uh, this has broadened my boundaries. But it is music that, if you like the kind of thing they do, which I've seen a lot of, it referred to as groove metal, which is interesting because for me there are. There are definite sort of cross- crossovers with hardcore in there. Um, when it's like, because there's there's a lot faster stuff on this than I than I kind of imagine that there is on most groove metal albums. Um, but one thing there is on this album is so much um, anger, a refreshing amount of anger for me. Um, not so much that y- you know you're like, oh no, not another angry song. No, not that much, but. Also, given that this band have been around for 30 years, that's another reason why I wanted to get Zoltan on, because I want, you know, like, dude, you're fucking angry. 30 years in, very cool. What's, like, you know, where's this anger coming from? What's the deal? Now, I'm not going to give anything away about the interview because I've already mentioned it in the last episode that it was it was one of, if not my favourite interview of last year. It's one of my favourite interviews that I've ever done and it's also one of the longest. Again, things I'm repeating from um, from the last episode. But there's a reason for that and um, the depth behind this album, um, the anger in this album is all very understandable, um, even more so when, you've, you know, when you listen to the interview. But more importantly, it's a rager for me. It's, um, you, you stick it on and it just absolutely fucking kills from minute to end. I think it's just over um, 30 minutes and it's 10 tracks. No, You know, there's no one's hanging around here. No one um, is, hanging out, is hanging around here. It is just brutal. From the opener, I'm your last hope, brackets, the rope around your neck, um, to the closer, which is Rem, 
Um, it is and in between there are some absolute awesome tracks uh, You and Me particular favourite um, I Don't Belong to You Never Be the Same Again um, and then the fucking frankly spooky Slayer-esque Vivid Black um, Ectomorph Vivid Black it's a fucking stomper a rager it sounds great to Madsen um, sorry probably most famous for working with um, Meshuggah um, he's worked with Exomov since the very beginning I, I mean I really enjoyed this album and it, it came at me in December and I totally took me by surprise totally took me by surprise came out of left field I was like oh right oh yeah the new Exomov oh cool um, I haven't had a pre-release of that before and boom it just came out of the speakers I mean I'm I'm pretty sure I listened to this well the first time I listened to it I then listened to it immediately again now it's not often that happens and that that is the sign of a fucking good album and this is a fucking good album there you go put that on a fucking poster you're not getting any of your oh well there's all sorts of uh, there's all sorts of genres meshed together here beautifully like a chef producing a perfect souffle no Howard says it's a fucking good album um, so there you go that is Ectomorph Vivid Black so next up we have well you know what the, the the thing about this album is it's I should have known that it was going to be awesome given that Michael Poulsen who is responsible for creating a whole genre of metal rockabilly metal with Volby I should have known that he's, he's always given his props to death metal his guitar hero is Scott is Chuck from um from death so I should have known that when he turned his hand to death metal that it would be high quality well fucking hell is it possible to be higher quality than I imagined it was going to be yes so as in hell is the band the album is called Impi Hora or Impi Horror I mean either way uh, you know I don't know what it means probably should have looked it up shouldn't I um, in fact might do that now um, but it is just yeah it is it's a proper album it really is it is a i mean what can i say um other than um after a few listens i just sat there and realized that i just had this smile on my face and the the smile on my face was the fact that i was pleased for a fellow musician I'm not putting myself in the same bracket as Michael Poulsen, please, okay? I would not do that. I, I have a little bit of self-awareness, okay? But I just had this, I was aware that I had this smile on my face. And the reason I was smiling was I was just pleased for a fellow musician who has done exactly what they've always wanted and pulled it off. Because this is a fucking classic cracking death metal album and when I say classic I mean of the classic era I mean there are you know there are big nods um, to death along the way there's also nods along the way to bands like Entombed um, all sorts of other death metal bands but mainly mainly um, uh, my favourite era of, of death which is but anyway look, I'm, I don't I don't want to spoil it for you okay but if you are in any way a fan of death you need to listen to this album and then you need to message me and thank me for making you aware of it but you probably already knew okay by the way impihora is latin for ungodly hour so there you go personally i'd have called it ungodly hour because impihora just looks a bit fucking silly but there you go that's just me isn't it i'm not in the band or in michael paulson's head for that matter um the fall uh, fall of the loyal warrior you can you can check the video out for that on youtube anytime you like um the, i mean again that is an awesome opener inner sanctified what a tune island of dead men brilliant trophies great track the ultimate sin yeah not a cover version of the Ovi, of the Aussie song um it is just another classic death metal tune uh, Wolfpack Laws, Desert of Doom, um, Pyromantic Scryer, Impihora, and 
Um, well, the last track is not even worth mentioning because it's like it's not a song; it's nine seconds long. But anyway, every single tune has got something to love about it for me. Well, it's my it's my fucking top albums, isn't it? So obviously, um, I think I've played nearly every song off that album on uh, my radio show I'm saying this a lot aren't I I'm not meaning to hammer the Patreon thing so apologies if I am well I am so apologies um, yeah it's just I think it is probably um, let me see I mean it, like death metal is not really something that I'm an expert in um, well another way of putting it is like I, I absolutely love death and after that, for me, there's a really big drop off. You know, I'm, I'm not a fan of Obituary. I'm not a fan of a Cannibal Corpse. I'm not really a fan of Blast Beats. So, for for something like this to come along, this is some. This is the kind of album that I have not had a feeling about this kind of music for a very, very, very long time. I just absolutely love it. The production is spot on. The vocals are fucking great. At times, sound a little bit like Chuck. At times, sound a lot like Chuck. <laughs> and at times, don't sound like Chuck at all. Uh, really, really great. Um, really interesting drums as well. It's very easy on this kind of music to, um, for me, it's very easy for the, the drums to be a bit pedestrian. But no, it's like there is some really interesting stuff going on. Um, and just all round this is just like yeah it made me smile and um it's many many years since a death metal album made me smile so yeah that's that's an achievement <laughs> not one that anyone's going to be actually bothered about but there you go uh next up was going to be he is legend endless hallway but as previously mentioned came out in 2022 um so after that well you know Anybody who listens regularly, anybody who uh, knows me, knows that I am an absolute total, have been for many years, prong fan. And it's been far too long waiting for prong. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, but it was worth the wait. State of emergency, it's, it's classic prong. It really is. And as I said to Tommy himself, it's like there's, there's tracks on here that could have been on the last well it could they could have come off any prong album it's almost like it's almost like if they'd taken one song off all their albums and then and re-recorded them and put the album out it would be like this now that's that's that is a compliment okay that's not meant to sound probably as shitty as it does <laughs> that is because it, it, it you get the idea i've done a bad i've done a bad description there I did a lot better description when talking to Tommy and such a good description that um, that I, I saw a video with him <laughs> where he says that, where he says ex virtually exactly what I said. Um, he's talking about the album. And he says, well, you know, a lot of people are saying that it sounds like there could be a song off of all of our albums on this one. And um, and the weird thing is that Tommy is also dressed exactly the same as he was when I spoke to him and he's in his house so I don't know I don't know if it was me first or look either way either way you know it's cool because this album is very very cool prong state of emergency there are um there's some interesting lyrics because there always is with prong there's and there's you know as always you know there's there's songs where you're like oh that's the single that's the catchy prong tune yeah great great chorus you're going to be walking around the house humming going what is that who is that what is it oh it's prong in it uh there's some some great uh really sort of weird varied stuttering tunes on there typical classic prong using um real kind of um offbeat rhythms to sort of throw you and then get you back and throw you again um, there is some uh, classic kind of Tommy, um, uh, what can I say, um, Venom. He's ba ba on there. There's some classic spleen being vented. And um, really, look, if you like Prong, then, you know, you've probably already got this album. Um, if you are not into Prong, this this is an album, as previously mentioned, about, you know, all the different styles and all the different vibes they've had over the years all being on one album 
this is a good place to start. This is as good a place to start as any. Um, it's that good. It is that good. I mean, in no, and with some with something like Prong, there's always the the trap that um, with a new album coming out that I can't stop myself having high expectations. And as we all know, high expectations ruin things because that's why I don't watch trailers for movies. Uh, utterly pointless. You know, friends, of mine, oh, the new so and so trailer's out. Pfft, really? Why the fuck would you watch that? Why would you watch key parts of the movie before you've seen the movie and all it does is play into your expectations? So raised expectations is always a difficulty. But with this bastard, oh, expectations delivered. Prong, state of emergency. This next album is in my list, despite the fact I've been listening to all the songs on it for a good couple of years. That's because I had the demos of this album a couple of years ago. And that's because um, Kelly Schaefer, he of Atheist and Till the Dirt, was kind enough to send them to me. Absolutely blew me away. This is the album of those demos, Till the Dirt, Outside the Spiral. Um, yeah, high expectations? Well, could have none higher than already having every song in demo form. Um, but they've all benefited from better production um, and the album just kills this is one of the most original things that you will hear from 2023 this is essentially death metal at times blended with stuff like alice in chains um soundgarden um even mastodon to give it a more you know a, a more recent influence there is real well just like the title track outside the spiral is like absolute pure intensity screaming death metal with a chorus that you know it, it reminds me of like soundgarden you know it's 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 insane maybe also without even knowing it there's little bits of uh, little sort of gajira in there as well that 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 kind of vibe so as you can appreciate from everything I'm saying and everything I'm mentioning, this is this is a, a work of art. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's no small statement, and I mean it. Um, and it is the first work of art that I'm going to mention because there's another another couple coming. Um, it's it's so it's so original that some it, that it's going to throw quite a few people and. I'm really hoping that this doesn't go the way of most of Atheist's back catalogue and that it gets appreciated 10 years too fucking late. Um, it deserves, it really deserves some appreciation. It really does, because it is a fucking... Uh, again, I think this could be a classic. I think this could be one of those albums where people go, wow. Unfortunately, I think this could be one of those albums that... Um, other bands who get much more success name check in years to come I really hope that's not the case but it is that good and if you like anything I've said about it then you should check out um, Out Spy Outside the Spiral by Till the Dirt um, and of course yeah it's fucking great and so is Kelly go back and listen to the interviews now here's a band I've never interviewed but I did see live um I think last year, and I was a bit disappointed, but I now realise it was probably more me than it was them. Um, and that is yet another fucking brilliant album from Haken. H-A-K-E-N. If you haven't heard of Haken, if you don't know who Haken are, then fucking hell, I can't help you. Where have you been? Get your head out your arse. Um, they, put out, they put out an album in lockdown called Virus, for fuck's sake. It came out just before Virus, and it's about a pandemic. These guys, what the fuck? How did they know? Um, that's an absolute classic album, and so is this. I mean, every single song kills, and there is some long fucking songs on this because this is the highest quality prog you could possibly imagine I mean they are one of Mike Portnoy's favourite bands where Mike Portnoy needed a band to do a project with yeah he asked if the if the Haken's drummer wouldn't mind stepping down and basically used the whole band yeah they are that fucking good 
um, from the opener, Taurus, um, which is just a Haken classic. The opening, the first single um, from this album was The Alphabet of Me. And I heard like the first, and I was like, oh, I'm really not sure about this. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm getting the album anyway. So I only listened to about a minute of it and I was like, oh, it'll make sense when I listen to the album. But it really left me with a kind of feeling of, oh, I'm really not sure. I, of course, I should have shut the fuck up. You know, like Haken don't know what they're doing. Honestly, if I, if I didn't like this album, it would be my fault. And as it turns out, I love it absolutely love it the only song that I'm like not totally absolutely in love with is the closing track which is bizarre but you know what I'll probably apologise at some point during the year for not getting that sooner and admit that that's brilliant as well but it is a wonderful wonderful album and to use that phrase you know work of art again Jesus that's the perfect phrase for this album because it is a work of art there is just so much in there there's so much depth there is so and and you know yes it's prog okay but again it's it's fucking quality from beginning to end there are huge riffs in this there are massive choruses there is so much to fucking love in here there is i honestly if you are into metal you have absolutely no reason to not try and listen to this album and give it a and i and i reckon you know that there are at least two songs on there that even if you absolutely detest prog there are two songs on there where you're going to have to go yeah fair enough because they're you know they they're under 4 minutes and you just have to go yeah well, okay fine yeah they do know what they're doing they are good songs so yeah haken fauna for fuck's sake check it out and finally, the final work of art, my last album that's on my favourites of 2023. I rediscovered Avenged Sevenfold. Yeah, I know. I have not uh, listened to Avenged Sevenfold or got any of their stuff for well over 15 years, if not longer than that. Uh, I mean, well, this is their eighth album. I think I bowed out after album number two. So it's been a while. First of all, I, I saw a clip of a video on YouTube and straight out the gate, I just thought, that sounds interesting. That sounds like a sound I haven't heard before. I mean, like by anybody, not just by Event Sevenfold. So I did some digging and... I did some digging. What? Like, uh, I had to do some fucking research. I got the album. Um, and it's the first album, uh, and probably the only album of the whole year, that actually challenged me, that just made me go, right, you actually need to pay attention here, because this, like, you, you can't just skate over this. You can't just sort of listen to it in the car. This is a proper sit down and get your head around it album um now the reason why i love it so much is also the reason why some people will hate it a lot um it's not particularly linear there are many parts to it that are um odd some of the songs to most ears will not make any sense in fact to my ears they don't make any sense but i still like them i mean i'm somebody who always bang bangs on about the craft of songwriting and some of these songs fly in the face of the craft of songwriting. They really do. It feels like it's bits and pieces of songs glued together and stuck together as one song. That is a perfectly valid observation and criticism. But I don't fucking care. I just fucking like it. And I don't know why. I It just... it. I don't know. For some reason, it just grabbed me. And I, I could easily sit here and and point out all the things that are wrong with it and why I shouldn't like it and why it doesn't work. But I do like it and it does work for me. But I can well imagine um, people not enjoying it. And that's another part of why I like it so much because the whole album is a massive fucking risk. The whole album is basically a band who have got to a level where they've kind of gone, do you know what? Let's just do an album for us. We're going to lose a load of fans, but we're so big, 
We can afford to lose a load of fans. And the ones that we keep, well, they're the ones that matter. And they're the ones that we, that, that we can progress with. And that'll be our fan base from now on. And those who don't like this album, well, you know, sorry, but it's your time to get off the train, you know. Um, I mean, and they've done all sorts of real guerrilla stuff on, um, on, this, uh, on this album. I mean, they hacked their own website and said that their tour was cancelled. And the manage management shat themselves and were going, fucking hell, you've been hacked. It says the and then uh, the band kind of left it for about a week or something and then and then told the management that it was it was them and they'd done it. <laughs> I bet the record company were fucking really happy about that. Um and I can also I can just imagine I can just imagine the, you know, Avenged Sevenfold's A and R man, bearing in mind that this is this is the first um album that they've put out since they settled their legal case. So they've spent a lot of time in court. They've also all done mushrooms. Um, and it says here, uh, Avenged, uh, uh, Avenged's eighth studio album, Life is But a Dream, is best served as a whole and consumed en masse to truly appreciate its music, musical breadth and sonic depth. Well, that's a great way of describing what I was saying about it's a bit fucked up and it's all over the place. Written and recorded over the span of four years. Yeah. The album is a journey through an existential crisis, a very personal exploration into the meaning and purpose and value of human existence, anxiety of death always looming. Especially for a band, obviously, who've lost, um, you know, lost a member and who was clearly, you know, a very close friend. So, it is risky. It is um, all over the place. It is self-indulgent. It doesn't give a fuck. And... I love it. Absolutely love it. I wondered initially if this album would stand, stand the test of time with me. It has very much so done that. And it, again, very much falls into the category of a work of art. And, um, uh, yeah, it's just, well, I kind of said all I've got to say about that, haven't I? Really? I really have. It's enough of me jabbering on. Fucking hell. Way too much of me jabbering on. It's time for a little chat. Now, this is proper old school. The irony is not lost on me. It, the irony of the fact that the, the podcast is 10 years old. And I am now going to uh, play a recording of an interview that sounds like I've learned nothing from my years of recording interviews because it's back to the old days. I'm in a dressing room. There's a fair amount of background noise my apologies but we're in a dressing room it's unedited as always it's not the greatest quality it's it could almost be 10 years ago okay but like i said you've got to have somebody else on this podcast other than me so this is myself and hatem from the fucking uk legends that are censor having a chat at the hundred club on oxford street just before christmas Tell me. Yeah, that is better. <laughs> that was better. <laughs> yeah, that's fine, mate. That's fine. Okay, as long as we can hear each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, let's just get straight into it. Um, it's been a while. I don't know how long it is, but Since it's been a while. We've seen each other. Yeah, already. yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a. Lo I, do you know what? Last time it was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's let's do some gigs together. We, we're bound to do some gigs together, and then. I think about a couple of years passed and then there was a pandemic and yeah. everybody's wondering whether they were going to have a band anymore and yeah. it's insane. It took us a really long time to wind back into it. Yeah. I had some health issues. I had oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, it's okay. It's just, well, they fixed it because I live in France and they just fixed it. I had a benign tumour between the wall of my skull and my brain. Wow. And they fucking took it out and they fixed it. It's amazing. Wow. That's um, so. Um, yes. Yeah, so I mean, a little sketchy on the details. But that's. I mean, I'm I'm hearing tumor, and as soon as you hear that, you just think. Yeah, it does make you panic. Yeah, yeah, it's just like. And I was going to ask if you're still living in France. Yes. Yeah. yeah so, still there. And how was how did they how did they deal with the with the pandemic? I mean, pretty oh, much the same as strictly, us. Like, yeah. It was more strict. There was like house arrest for a long right. time it looks like that that scene in uh, Goodfellas where they're all uh, they're in prison you know but they're eating really well remember that scene <laughs> yeah they're like spraying the, cutting the garlic with a razor blade dude and... a, ma a man after my own heart we've got the same cultural references yeah 
Yeah. It was like that. I felt like that. I had like lots of beautiful wine and really nice food. But um, yeah, they really locked it down hard over there. So yeah. Yeah. We, no, I... Yeah, we like, and the people, the, when it first started, there were people above me in my building and below me who had COVID. So it was pretty, you know, you could hear the ambulances blasting past. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it hit quite hard, but they really made a big effort to lock it down. Yeah. It seems like, it seems like another, well, it was another world, but it seems like so long ago. Yes. Wow. It's really weird. Mm. I, I can't believe it was like three years because it just seems so long. I mean, I've, I think I've only just got out of lockdown in the last six or nine months. Right. Just mentally. Mo- yeah, yeah. Mentally moving on from it. Yeah. Um, no, it got. I think I jumped pretty quickly out of it, but the rest of the world seemed to take a long time, and like this sort of stuff took a while to pick up again. Well, that's why. That's why I was. That's what was doing my head in most of all was the the fact that even you know when slash if what we do comes back yeah it's going to be the last thing yeah right it's going to yeah. be the last fucking thing yeah so everybody else is going oh i'm back to work and they're like yeah no sign of that <laughs> yeah i was really lucky also to my work i managed to this you know because i teach at, at, at like art schools in, in paris i have like a this other kind of world of stuff that i do so that stuff i maintained all the right. way through so that was good and it was really cool for people to have that sort of yeah, like it was hard for musicians. If that's all you were doing, then you know, you know, it was, it was. I mean, I'm sort of telling everybody the obvious now, but it was a nightmare for musicians. I think. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I was. It was. I mean, I, everything I do is like you know, the music, stand up, uh, whatever. Yeah, it's people. all performance. Yeah. And yeah, it's just kind of like. I mean, I got to do a shitload of podcasts. Yes. Um, that must have flourished. It, yeah, it did, but it was really weird. I, I kind of. Um, sparked up some weird friendships as well like I, I could you could because everybody was available mm. you know so um, I, it's like yeah I ended up um, uh, Dog Aldridge like the famous rock drummer like you know, he's played with like Alice Cooper and, okay. and like we ended up doing like two three hour podcasts to just Amazing. talk about all sorts of stuff. Yeah, having someone like that who's just dis- at your disposal to talk is amazing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it was it was just it was it was really strange, but um, it was it, you know it, it's it's done. We're but we're all back yeah. out. We're all we're all made it through. We're, we're we're safe and we're back yeah. in business. And um, I just wonder what uh, what your plans are moving forward. Uh, yeah, well, after tonight. <laughs> so there's so next year is going to be the 30th anniversary of our first album, Census first album. Right. So there's going to be, and there's it's going to coincide with, a new, hopefully, it, well, well, there's a new record that's recorded that needs no, to be mixed. Blue roll still. Right. Um, yeah. That's good news. Uh, what else can I say? No. Yeah, well, there's a new load style record, which is oh, been, right. Remember that band? Yes. Uh, so that's there's a. Uh, yeah, there's a record. That record is mixed. We probably need to. Could you close that for us, Tom? Yeah. Thanks, mate. Yeah. So that um that record is mixed. There's a couple of um videos. Uh, there should be like three videos ready when that comes out, probably early next year. Um, I knew yeah. Lone Star record though. That. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's a surprise. Yeah. And there's when you that. say remember, do you know what? You've just you've just reminded me. That, um, I think we talked about this last time, mate. Yeah, I saw you supporting Tool. With, with, with Lodestar? Or with yeah. Fiend? Because I've, I've supported support a couple of bands. Really? It was with Lodestar? Okay. At the Astoria? So that's like in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. At the Astoria? The Astoria Theatre, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you well, got, that's where... I think you came on and, I think you came on and did some, some vocals with Tool as well. It's quite possible. I've, I've done it a couple of times. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They... Uh, that's that was a, yeah that was a great time. I, I, we toured with them on the Enema tour, I think. Yeah, and then that was just magic. Yeah, man. yeah, that was that was amazing. That was a, every gig that was at the Astoria seems amazing now, you know. Sorry. Every gig that was on the uh, the Astoria seems amazing now. Yeah, yeah. Was I remember there was like Slayer did multiple nights at the Astoria. Was that nice the yeah. yeah I saw good. we saw yeah, then we saw things like uh Pantomast there and uh Mike Patton's band like Tomahawk and Yeah. 
It was I just some amazing band. I saw, um, I saw Slipknot's first ever UK show there. Yes. I watched it, I stood next to Bjork watching it, which amazing. is just like weird. Um, it is like really strange coming out of Tottenham Court Road like Station now and just... Just, just well, you're in the Astoria, planet. aren't you? That's where I came out to come come here tonight. Well, yeah, and it is, it's just kind of like it's just gone. Yeah, uh, they sort of. Well, we lost two venues as well. With we, we lost LA. Well, we lost well, we lost LA too. LA two. The underground. The un- venue, underworld. Which is underworld. Cool as hell. The underground. The underworld. You still got that? Up oh, sorry, not the kind of uh, the borderline. Borderline. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. No, it's ridiculous. It is. It's ridiculous. But that's um, why I really like coming to this place because it's like one of the last bastions of like this type of anything, where, a venue where you can have anything yes. in the centre of London in Oxford Street. Yeah, so I love it. Yeah, and there's so much history with this place as mm. well, isn't there? I mean, it, like everyone who's anyone has played it. Yeah, I mean, it starts in the jazz, London Soho jazz era, yeah. as far as I know, and then yeah, it goes through. All the 60s and the punk bands, it's just everything, everything. Yeah, yeah. So I'm keen to get back to, um, to uh, what made you dip into the Lodestar world again? Find a wall. Just like uh, Haggis wrote some cool little bits of music and we were like, this just sounds great. So me, him and Johnny got together and just like, like put our parts to it. And then he redid his part, so it just we made a record. Like we decided we were going to make a record, and then we got this girl Charlie Beddows who is in the band called Rub Ultra. I don't know if you remember them. Um, London vaguely sort of, rings a bell. Yeah, they were one of the only bands that were experimenting with sort of kind of some sort of funk and riffs in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, really. right. Yeah, there weren't a lot of people doing that, really. They were just one of the early precursors of that sort of trying to do grooves and riffs at the same yeah. time. So yeah, they were great. And she's a fucking brilliant bass player, so she's playing bass on it. Uh, no, she's playing bass live. She's done a little bit on the record, but we kind of did that before she arrived. But yes, yeah, so that's really exciting. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on. I just did a track with Mike Ladd. It's like a poet rapper guy. I did have some recordings with Dylan Carlson from Earth. Oh right. Yeah, because I'm a big fan of him. He's a good friend. He's a good friend. Um, I've done some recording with this lady called Yaz Ahmed, who's a trumpet flugelhorn player. I wow. And I just like making interesting music. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Just collaborating with lots of different people. Writing. I like to write. So yeah. I'm on the, still writing my second novel. Well, it's not a novel; it's short stories. But second book. Well, it's, fun, it's funny you should bring up writing because I um, this is going to sound like I'm name dropping, but I'm not. Um, it's all right to name drop. Cool. Okay, good. Right. Well, I, I got to interview my my hero, who is um, Fish from Marillion, because um, I fell in love with words. I fell in love with his words as much as the music. And when we were talking, he said really casually. I'm a writer who can sing. I'm not a singer who can write. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 you know, and it just hit me that it's like that's me. Mm. I've, I've never felt comfortable with putting myself as a singer because it's about the words. It's like okay. I've still got members in the band who are like you know what melody have you got in mind? For this? I'm like, I just wrote the words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, well, I wasn't so think, the melody about the words. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's like I wasn't thinking about. Yeah. It. It's more important to get the words what you're right. Saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And um, go on. And, and that that was kind of like a bit of a moment for me. So now when anyone brings it up, I'm kind of like, what are you? Mm. Are you a singer who can write, or are you a well, writer who can sing? Very recently, uh, my friend helped me out with this exact question because, like. And he said, you don't have to do any of that. You can just say you're a multimedia yeah. artist and uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. You just do what you want. Because right, yeah. you don't have to constantly be justifying what you're doing. You know, there are lots of people like that that we know of who have been in bands. And, you know, it, it's really 
when I say we're yeah, you, if you, you call yourself that, Westbrook. then you can live up to that. Just right. like, then you don't have to be limited to being this or that. Because like, I stopped from the very beginning. I started off doing rap music, and then I became a singer, and then you know, it's just. I don't. I just. So then I had to call myself a vocalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Because you don't think of yourself as a singer. Yeah, yeah but it's just like. I'm not going to say I'm a rapper. It, 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 in the end, it was very convenient. I know it comes from some people like Laurie Anderson and David Byrne. They just said, I'm a multimedia artist. Yeah. So you don't have to keep explaining yourself. It's like, yeah. I do what I've ever, you know, I fucking want. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I just found it, I found it kind of comforting because mm. it was, I, I could never, I could never reason with it. I mean, I always said I love doing everything other than the physical act of singing which was just a bit of a bind okay do you know what I mean yeah, yeah. and I, I could never kind of get my head around it I mean those days are gone and I enjoy it more now but I'm I'm the first one to say do we really need vocals in this bit right. do you know what I mean because yeah, yeah. I don't have that singer yeah. oh I'm going to sing on this like no 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 like it's the song yeah absolutely whatever you do always has to serve a piece of whatever you know it's the, yeah the idea of you know, one of my friends coined the term like the LSD, the lead singer's disease. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's um, once you're aware of that, you're like, oh yeah. If did you, you can just let go of it and just do whatever serves the music, yeah. do whatever serves the piece, whatever you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, it, it's just that I always, I always want to. If I'm listening to music, even if I'm making the music. I want to hear it through the listeners' ears because I'm a fan. You know, you're a fan first, aren't you? That's why you get in a band because yeah, just playing it's not that's enough. The, you know, just listening to it's not enough. You've got to, you've got to get in there. That's the right reason to be like, you know, a, a fan of music, and then to think, well, what would I like to hear? Yeah, that's it. What would I really like to hear? Yeah, absolutely. What kind of rep, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I was having a discussion with um, our guitarist. We're working on an album at the moment. And there's this, there's this little section, and it's, there's just a chord hang, and the vocals come in, and he's like, "There needs to be, there needs to be like, a, 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 like even if it's just a tap, a hi hat in the back, in, in the background." I was like, "Why?" He said, "Because otherwise it leaves it hanging, and you don't know what the timing is." It's like you're a musician. Yeah. That's why you think like that. But normal people. Yeah. Yes. No. Listeners aren't going to sit there and going, "Oh, I wonder what timing this is coming yeah, in at." Exactly. It doesn't work like that. You can feel it. Then whatever it is, you, you can make it work. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they're not sat there going, "Oh, this chord's hanging. I wonder what timing they're going to come in on." Yeah. It's like no, they're just waiting for whatever's next. It thinks, does it work? Does it sound good? Does it sound yeah. right? Does it do? It? Does it, is it? Does it function? That's the kind of art world word. You know, think about it. Does does it, does it make the hair stand up on end? Yeah. Does it give you, does it take you somewhere? There's a million ways to sort of express that thing. Yeah. My friend who's a philosopher, uh, uh, he wrote the foreword to my book, he's a very old friend. He talks about the sublime, you know, like when you're standing in front of the Grand Canyon, you're facing the sublime. It's something that's just larger than yourself. But with music, it doesn't have to be large or small. It can be the sublime in music. It's like it can be anything that gives you that weird feeling of goosebumps yeah. or transportive thing. Like so, yeah. That's it's much more. It's it's a uh, whatever can take you towards that. Yeah, it's yeah. great. I find myself as I get older having more visceral emotional reactions to music mm. than than I did when I was younger it basically I can be moved to tears yeah. a, a lot easier than, than I used to be and it hits me a lot harder it's, I, I, I got an album in lockdown and it was like it's just, it was just genius and it, it just I had to just sit down you know yeah. and, and I, I, I think I, I attribute it to getting older because that's the only I think that's oh, yeah, 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 what it is. A bit of that, but yeah, it might just be that. Yeah, it might, maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. There's, I remember there's certain. Yeah, there are certain pieces of music that you, I can't. I tried to. My friend wanted to do a cover of "I See a Darkness" by Bonnie Prince Billy. He wanted me to play guitar on it. I'm trying to learn it, and I just can't get through one. I can't get through it once without falling. I can't do it. It's just because it's like it's. 
it's like he's speaking in this way that just makes you it's your it's like it's like you speaking yeah and it's like oh shit you know you're completely vulnerable yeah so yeah. and I'm I'm such a pain when I find something like that as well I've got to tell everybody I know mm. you know I've got to I've got to sh- I've got to share, share it, it. Mm. because I kind of feel you feel like you've discovered this thing and it is it's so good mm-hmm. that it, it's your job to make sure that other people get to hear this as well. It's very, you know, it's very, I can, it's, um, yeah. uh, it's very preachy, but you know, it's, it's, I don't know what I've, what I've always done. I think it, there's, it's just something about music that, that makes me want to share it with people. Mm-hmm. And especially if you discover something special that you just want to, yeah, you, it's kind of like you almost want to improve people's lives. It sounds terrible, doesn't it? Well, it <laughs> doesn't sound terrible. Is it, well, it's just that music has so many functions and has so many, can be so many things to so many people. So like, sometimes what you want is something that's just brutal. Something that's just like, you know. Yeah, something that just hits you over the head. Yeah, or you want something that's just really, you know, obscene or something that's re- really like, you know, like, I'm just thinking of like the birthday party where it's like, it's not, they're not trying to make you happy, you know, they're not trying to make you, you know, just, yeah. they don't give a fuck about that, you know, uh, or, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for good, for just a good old pop song as well. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, someone was talking about it. I think, no, no, it was me that was talking about that. It's like, it's like food, you know. Sometimes you just want to eat bubble gum, you know, and chew bubble gum. Sometimes you want like some really wholesome thing that's just gonna like warm you. Sometimes you want like fast food. It just, yeah, it's really like that feeling. I, I'm someone that really likes food, so I definitely see a connection. You're in the you're in the right country then. <laughs> in, pa- in France, yeah, uh, yes, yeah, definitely. I think England's got way better in the last twenty years as well. It used to be pretty nightmarish in the nineties, yeah, but now you can eat fairly well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, London especially. Yes, you know, London especially. But as we all know, London is a country of its own that, uh, that exists separately from the rest of the UK. Think, though, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, we went up to Boston to play. Uh, but Boston, Lincolnshire. Uh, is it Lincolnshire or Lancashire? It's Lincolnshire, yeah. yeah. Yes. And uh, yeah, it's a different world. Yeah. Different, like, and it's really cool though. I mean, it's a beautiful old town. Uh, but yeah, it's like, it's, you know, when you're used to hanging out in London, you're just like, oh, yeah. yeah. The rest of the country is not this, is it? After eight o'clock at night, yeah. do you want pizza or curry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's usually from the same shop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Kebab, fish, pizza, curry. I yeah. love those yeah. ones. Like, kebab, fish, pizza, curry. But that's, a, but that's all they have in, 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 in Scotland. It's like they, they I, I had a couple of Scottish girlfriends in my time. Yeah, no, no, but I, I have a couple of Scottish girlfriends over and they and they just basically had like they don't even have a fish and chip shop. It's like basically if you have a shop like that, you do everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My favourite thing of course being uh, a pizza crunch. Do you know what a pizza crunch is? Is it where they fold it and dip it in the batter and fry it? Good shout, yes. <laughs> well, I've never gone there. I've never um, gone. But I have had the deep fried black pudding and my digestive system was not happy. Really? Yeah, the di- don't don't do it kids. I tell you what I tell you what I can go for. Deep fried cream egg. Again, that's nice. It's been a while. You just stick with the fish and the chips, you know. I don't need to like I'm, I'm done with deep frying rando thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Chip, chip, chips and scraps. That's all we could all we could afford when we were kids. I like yeah. chips and curry sauce. I like a lot of chips. Right? That's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's I like a, yeah. like a saveloy. I don't give a shit. Like, I, I mean, in general, I eat really well. I eat like really decent food because I'm in, in, um, we're in Paris. And yeah. I've got access to really decent. Are they? Oop. Where is she? Probably eating. Unless anyone's got a Damn it. Your merch isn't popular, is it? What a pain. Oh, yeah. How much are they going for? I haven't given anything. We'll find out. Hold on, Ruth. Do you want to pause it? Yeah, 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 yeah. No worries, man. I'm going to have to head off anyway. So let's wind up there on the Savaloy then, shall we? All right. It's been a pleasure 
man. Good to see you, man. Yeah, good to see, see you again. I'm glad you're still with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you too. <laughs> Yeah, I'm quite glad to still be with us as well, to be honest. Um, I, um, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did doing it. It was really cool. And yeah, so we end up talking about food a lot, all right? And there's only 20 minutes and it's not great quality. Um, but at least it's something other than me jabbering on about me and my opinions about music, etc. So thank you very much for listening. This is the first of many to come this year. Cracking uh, interview coming up next episode. But I was, it was great to catch up with Hatem there. And I, we've got so much to talk about. Definitely going to get him back on. Also, um, uh, possibly, I had, a, I had a conversation with the guitarist in Sensor in, um, uh, in the room um, after Hatem had gone out. We were chatting away. And um, and he said, um, oh, so are you in a band as well as doing this podcast then? I said, yeah, yeah. And he was like, oh, what, what, uh, what band? I said, oh, I'm in a thrash metal band called Acid Rain. And he went, fucking hell, really? A UH? I was like, uh, yeah. He was like, I saw you guys supporting Exodus and supporting Flotsam and Jetsam at the Astoria back in the day. And I remember thinking, if British bands can do it, you know, and and you were one of the guys, one of the bands that I saw, British bands that made me think, you, you know, we, I, I can do this, I can be in a band. And I was completely floored because, like, Sensor to me are up on a, on a on a pedestal of, you know, one of the greatest UK bands ever. And yeah, just a really weird feeling if, if I'm honest, especially like in person. I really wasn't prepared for it. Um, so anyway, yeah, hopefully I'll get those guys back on very soon. Thanks for listening, as always. I've mentioned Patreon enough. There's links in the show notes to all sorts of bits and pieces. Uh, well, probably just Patreon and the reducer. But as always, thank you for listening. Thanks for uh, tuning in. And uh, let's go out and smash 2024 together. <laughs>